All right, welcome everyone. Welcome to our third um, artist talk in our Southbound Artist Talk series. I'm Courtney Taylor, Curator and Director of Public Programs at LSU Museum of Art. It's my honor to welcome you um, along with our guests on behalf of the museum. Um, before I introduce everyone, I would like to invite you to attend our last talk, which will be Thursday night at 5.30 with McNair Evans and Susan Worsham. Um, I'll be hosting that conversation. It's the final in our series. And I also just wanna point out that the two that we had last week are already up on YouTube. If you missed those, um, you can go watch them anytime at your convenience. I also wanna thank our sponsors for both this exhibition um, and of this programming series the Arts Council of Greater Baton Rouge with support from the Office of Mayor President Sharon Western Broom and the Metro Council um, really supported bringing this exhibit to um, Baton Rouge and supported this programming. Um, our programming is also supported by LA CAT. And I need to also thank the Halsey Institute who um, organized this exhibition at the College of Charleston. Um, so we're really excited we've had it here. It stays on view until February 14th. And our galleries have um, instructions for safe viewing. You can come see the exhibition in your mask. It's not that busy. And there are posted guidelines for how many people can be in every gallery. So I invite you to come before it closes. Um, I also want to note that closed captioning is available during this talk. You can follow the link that I've already posted in the chat. Um, and the program will last roughly an hour. So we're going to do uh, 35 to 45 minutes with Dr. Joyce Jackson leading a conversation um, with our guests. And then we'll open the Q&A for you. So feel free to post your questions at any time in the chat and we'll get them in at the end. Um, or at the end, you can raise your hand when we click out of the slideshow. We'll, be, we'll unmute you and you can join the conversation um, yourself. I also wanna note, I'll be posting a link if you would like to support programs like this um, all of our exhibitions and programs are 100% donor funded. Um, so we appreciate any support that you want to throw our way. <laughs> um, and with that, I think I'm gonna move to introducing our facilitator for the night, Dr. Joyce Jackson. She is a board member at LSU Museum of Art. We're proud to say, also serves on the collections committee. And she's associate professor at LSU of Geography and Anthropology and formerly directed the African American Studies Department. She well, special, sorry. Well, well professor. Full, oh, I'm sorry, Joyce. They gotta update your, <laughs> they gotta update your webpage. Um, full <laughs> professor. And she kind of specializes in studying African American culture and music, the roots of jazz in rural and coastal Louisiana and sacred and secular rituals in Africa and the diaspora. Um, a, huge list of publication, teaches a range of classes, um, really a kind of a rock star professor, and we are excited to have her here hosting this conversation. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Jackson. Thank you, Courtney, appreciate that. Uh, and I'd like to say good evening to everyone, and um, thank you for joining us on the Zoom for the uh, conversation with Keith and Chandra. It really gives me great pleasure to um, to sit here and have this conversation with them because they are actually my friends. We have known each other for quite some time. I think it was like in the early 90s when I met them in the streets of New Orleans uh, shooting. Both of them were shooting along with uh, my husband at the time. And um, we, they, you know, we just you know, had this camaraderie out there dealing with the rituals in the streets of New Orleans. So it is good to be able to sit here, down, sit with them tonight and just catch up, you might say, and see what they've been doing within the last few years. Um, but I just want to tell you just a little bit about them. They are partners in life um, who collaborate as a team. Both were born a, a few years apart in the Lower Ninth Ward. And um, this is an area that most of you may know that is the largest community of African-American homeowners in the country before Hurricane Katrina hit in, 19, in 2005. But their linked careers have focused on documenting the African-American communities in life and the life experiences in New Orleans and the surrounding parishes. And they have worked on an array of, uh, in, in various areas of, um, for the last 25 plus years together. 
And uh, you, you find, you, you, you see images of brass bands, uh, Mardi Gras Indians, um, second line uh, parades, uh, laborers, um, incarcerated folks, and just on and on and on. So we're gonna talk about some of those tonight before we actually get into the exhibit that is here at the um, LSU Museum of Art. Um, I wanna start by just letting them tell us about how did they get together and how were they both introduced to photography? Uh, Keith and Shai, you, you, you know, you, you, you're a team, so you just go at it. I like that story. I always joke with them about the story of how they met, so. My introduction to photography was actually through Keith, but I, I had sought out um, a person to do images of myself. And a girlfriend of mine, one of my close friends who I'm still really good friends with in high school, she introduced me to Keith, who, who then took those images of me. And um, I, uh, I got all of my images except one. And he had to make, he had to print that one. And so, he said, it wouldn't take, it won't take me long. Um, I could print it for you. And so I went into his dark room with him and he made the image, he printed it. And um, I was really fascinated just by watching the image come up, you know, and the solitude of the dark room and everything. And I asked him to teach me. And so I started um, working as his assistant and also his, you know, his darkroom technician. And I loved um, working in the darkroom, uh, playing music, you're away from everybody. And it's, you know, I just had eight, nine, 10 hours to just work by yourself and alone. So I kind of got used to doing that. And he encouraged me to shoot because I would, I would be critical. I think through the printing, I developed an eye to, um, to see composition better, and um, I would, I would, I would just call out distractions yeah. in the image, and he, he said, you know, you should shoot because you have a good eye, and so I just started shooting, and you know, the conversations were always about lighting, and you know, you have to make sure that your subject is in the best light, and I had to you know, shoot things at different times and, and and like that. And so that just drew me in more. So once I started um, actually making images, I really, really loved it. And so a lot of our work um, became intertwined because one of his first exhibitions was dock workers. And I remember, you know, trying to print that exhibition up. And so, yeah. Yeah, Chandra. Chandra was good, a good listener and a good person who, to be honest, I didn't like the dark room. And she was more patient in printing and getting the tonal values out to printing. And But then I started encouraging her to shoot, and that's why I messed up, because all the films started leaving out my dark room. And we would go to events. <laughs> and I would have like five rows, and I look at Chandra, she got 10 to my five. And that way she kept shooting to develop an eye, which was good because at that time we were bulk loading film and it, and it was, you know, when she started making her own prints, she had already was frame conscious. And I think a lot of that had to do with her, her style, you know, like she liked to work with the wide angle nails a lot. And um, how did you get your start in photography? Oh. My start came when I went to Los Angeles. My sister would send for me to come live with her in Los Angeles. And she was involved in a lot of stuff. Um, and at that time, it was the height of the, you know, the black movement. You know, they had the Watch Writers Workshop, uh, Inner City Culture Theater. And um, so she would bring me to different places and got me involved. Like I was able to get involved with the brothers at the Watch Writers Workshop the Watts Prophets, they kind of was under my wing and I became like the photographer going all 
community events and through that, you know, I was able to work for a few papers and develop. Um, but then I wasn't satisfied with Los Angeles. I came back home and somehow I wound up back in this ninth ward in the swamp and got Chandra together here with us becoming a team, you know, and we started, uh, I had a little studio and we was um, documenting and was another photographer who worked with Harold Barquet, who was a, like a family member to us because we were all self-taught photographers. And we would, um, you know, we would get together and Chandra at that time, um, it wasn't many women shooting around the city at that time, you know, so it was an honor for me to see her, you know, you know, to be out on, you know, to be in it. So, but my start come from really going out to Los Angeles and my sister, she influenced me a lot by buying equipment I needed. Okay. Well, let's start um, talking about some of the exhibits that you all have had. Some of your earlier ones were uh, focusing on the river road. So you all did a lot of, uh, work in the back roads of uh, Louisiana in uh, South Louisiana. What, did you have relatives out there or, you know, was there some type of personal relationship to bring you to the uh, river road and those other areas or, or you just ventured out and just. Well, every week we find out we can make images and sometimes we just ride. And, you know, one thing about people in the rural, they're more relaxed than in the city and we, me and Sean, I'm sorry, Sean. You can do whatever you want. She keeps telling me I'm sitting the wrong way or something. No, you're not. Anyway, what happened was my first essay was the Doc Worker series. And from that series, we started venturing up the river road along the cane because the cane, um, we were more interested in the demise of labor, how things were changing at that time. You know, the doc, my father was a doc worker. So when we, started photographing the docks. The docks to me was the back of the city for black people. My father and all the men he hung out with every day. They played cards. They 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 were men who came from all parts of the country life and they they got together and some of them helped build each other houses. So when I was growing up I heard a lot of stories about working in the cane, uh men work puck wood and stuff. So after finishing the dock work, because me and Sean started, Sean said, well, let's go up to the River Road. And that's when we started riding up the River Road. And after that, the plantations were in transformation. At that time, the machines were coming in. And the people who were scrapping the cane, you know, they were being pretty much put put off, the, off those places. So we were interested in documenting. And from there, um, Angola. You know, well, let's was, look at some of we have some of the images of the river road plantations and the sugar cane. Uh, so let's talk about some of these. As you see, the first one. Mm -hmm. Tell us, tell us about these. Sugar cane. This sugar. is a a picture from uh, a plantation called Bessie K, and this is a young woman named Joyce Priestley. She had three kids, and her sister herself and her two sister-in-laws, they all worked in sugarcane fields. Um, when we first parish started- was What parish was this? St. James. St. James. St. James. Mm -hmm. When we first started, there were, there were a lot of women working in the fields and, and they had a couple of men, but most of the men drove the tractors or the machines that burned the, um, the shuck from the cane. So we spent a lot of time with this family. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I just. Mm. Next slide. And this is, um, this is, this is on Bessie Case plantation as well. And this is some of those women that I talked about in the field. And um, I, when I look at this picture, I think about, um, Lead, Lead Belly had a, has a song and he talks about how one of the lines in the song talks about how in 1910, um, they worked women hard as they worked the men. 
And so I, I just look at all those women were in the field. They, like I said, they had men, but most of the men worked on tractors or some type of machinery. Okay. Next slide. This is a photograph I took. Uh, was in the Lower Ninth Ward at a Boogie Bill Webb, who was a blues singer. And like I said, one time in the Ninth Ward, um, you can go around to different people houses, and they've had fish fries. Um, they get together. Men would go fishing and come back and cook, and they jam. You know, and we would go over. Me and Chandra and just hang out while 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 they get together. And that's pretty much the guy you can't hardly see, but in the corner there's a guy holding the glass, and that was Boogie Bill holding the glass with slim guitar, slim. But you know, we didn't have to go far to make the images we make. You know, every day we can walk right out of well, now it's kind of changing now, but at one time in New Orleans, you could pretty much uh, walk out the door and there was a lot of imagery around. Right. Next slide. That is just going to the river one morning um, up in the Bashery. Mm -hmm. And something about this picture is real spiritual the way these young sisters was walking it together like that, you know, and capture my eye. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I have one like that hanging on my wall. <laughs> Enjoy it. <laughs> now, this is a brother, Tyrone Edwards, who was a good friend of ours, was his church down in Phoenix, Louisiana. Mm -hmm. And um, Reverend Summers. I think he was, yeah, yeah, it's Reverend Summers. And this is called The Prayer. Um, the five girls were being baptized in the river. Mm -hmm. The minister saying the prayer before they went in. What's the, what um what parish was this one in? That's Phoenix, Louisiana. That's down in Plaquemine, Plaquemine. Parish. Mm -hmm. Going towards uh Aunt Lahash. Okay. Next slide. And this is a uh, a little girl named LaShonda Morgan. Um, yeah, Ashland Allendale Plantation. It's, uh, it's over the river from Baton Rouge. And um, that's, that's a family uh, Oops, that we followed. Um, Val and, and, and this is, well, this is LaShonda. And, and actually, this image I took, because, you know, I made this image because I was, it was, it was cold, it was winter, and I was out. They, they live near tracks, and so I'm photographing things on the railroad track, and then when I walked toward the home, she was looking out that missing uh, weather board, and I, 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 I just took the picture because, and she was like, hey, Chandra. And I took the picture of her, but I took the picture. People think that's a fence, but I took the picture to just, because that's actually the house and wind, air is getting in there. Yeah. They had like, to cover from the inside to cover the stuff like that they had cardboard yeah there's places in louisiana where the civil rights haven't been yet that we can show you but that was um so what composition like what, what would some of these places look like today if you go back to some of these same areas um saint james parish plaquemines parish a lot of them become commercial where they be in bees and it didn't change now. You know, this was part of the time when automation, to me, it, it was like now, it was, it was because of the technology was changing. So a lot of these places not even in existing no more. And a lot of the people were just put off because 
you know, you go to a plantation now, it's maybe one or two people running it. They got a machine. They might have a couple workers there and that's it. So a lot of them are now tourist destinations. Yeah. So people go there and they tell the stories of the plantation minus the workers and those people who did all that stuff. Yeah, because like even Evergreen, didn't we? A lot of those places we photographed at that time, they was in the transition of turning over. Now, now we have been back to visit this particular place, and those houses are the same. Mm -hmm. But but like um, where where they have the um, farmland at um, some of those places, they've built something on it or something and it's like a tourist gift shop some of them built two three thousand hundred thousand houses i mean big expensive houses too on the land yeah but i'm just saying like a lot of some we we went back to just yeah do a tour of where we had been mm -hmm. and some of those places are like gift shops are there and you know people go in to get a history and tours and stuff like that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So a lot of it has been lost. A lot of the traditions in that area have been lost. Yeah, yeah. a lot of the people, like I was saying, it was forced off to come live in the city. Some of them been pushed out to come live here. Like at one time we had people who were leaving the backwoods coming to the city, which was just as worse because it's, it wasn't much here to, answer, mm -hmm. to offer, you know? And like now, you know, as we document, unfortunately we document now, on the back roads, it's more prisons in these private owned towns than people, women are working. Pretty much now, they coming after the women to incarcerate more than, than the men. But a lot of these parishes don't have a need for labor when they got free, when they got private owned prison, they can get the labor out done like that now. So it's not like much of an economic engine for these people to survive. Right, right. Next slide. Let's see. Next. Going into Treme mm -hmm. now, and um, Treme is for most people in New Orleans. It's like the pulse of the city. That's where you find Congo Square. It's one of the oldest neighborhoods in the country, and a lot of the tradition bearers are there, and a lot of the the parading and the uh, the wonderful music and all that sort of emanates out of um, out of that area, and yeah. you find these traditions that are there and they some of them have changed to a certain extent since uh, Katrina, but you all have documented so much and you all have uh, just, you know, preserved a lot of this that people will not be able to see anymore. But talk, talk to us about, um, about this piece. Um, this lady is dancing on top of a casket for those of you who really can't, can't see it well. She's on top of a casket dancing. And tell us about yeah, the story the of this. We call that cutting the body loose, and nobody can cut the body loose like Lois Andrews, who is to me one of the keepers of the culture, her whole family. I mean, you can't even go to Treme while running into the Andrews or the Nelson, but this is Trumpet Black funeral, who was a great trumpet player. And it was, you know, sending them off. And uh, and it just showed the love of the community, you know, people, you know, I mean, even today they had a big funeral for a musician, we know, but it's like when, when, when I look at this picture, you know, the, the love and the respect of community, you know, it's, it's at its highest here, you know. What's her relationship to trumpet? And she was trumpet black um, aunt. The Andrews family, Lois Andrews, she's been a iconic figure because she, at times, I remember Lois taking kids, getting instruments, going to the pawn shop, buying all those kids instruments and letting them learn how to go work in the quarter, play, you know, trombone, shorty, all those kids, her son, all of them grew up. James Andrews, they, you know, they all musicians, the whole family. Mm -hmm. and, and then too, she was a parent um, like he said, she, she, she would buy instruments and put in kids' hands. I remember she wanted to start an all-girls brass band. Thank you. And um, 
they would go to Jackson Square when, when the kids would leave Treme to go and play music. Her and I remember Philip Frazier's mother, they would be the two women that guardianed all those kids. I mean, she's... she's I'm not gonna go into Treme without seeing the Andrews or the Nelson family, I can tell you that. And anything related to music, one of them gonna be there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Next slide, please. That is, that's um, Dut, and well, they called him Dut. His name is Ch uh, his name is uh, Alfred Lazardi, and the man in the middle is uh, Mr. Johnny Youngblood, and the Grand Marshal on the other side. I can't remember his name, but he was uh, a part of a lot of the clubs in Treme, and he also was a member of the Zulu. And this is a funeral um for one of the Treme sports, I yeah, think. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Would you talk a little bit more about the uh the, um the social aid and pledger clubs? Well, um the social aid and pleasure clubs, it's a, a lot of pleasure now, but they actually used to be um, patterned behind the benevolent societies, which, which like they were an organization or an auxiliary club that raised money. They took care of each other. They had insurance policies. Um, they owned mm -hmm. buildings. You know, they, they were, um, and I think that, you know, they were, a, a working class of men, but but they actually back a long time ago, they actually worked and they built things together. They, you yeah, know, houses. built finance, housing and all of that. Um, the Young Men Olympian and in New Orleans, they at one time owned that Howard and is that Howard and John? It's the building no, on Loyola I'm, with the I'm, big the, the, clarinet. The drawing what is it yeah thank you it that there. building they they owned that building at one time so like i said it's a lot of pleasure now but at one time they were really building our community and doing things um not to say that they aren't now but those that that's how it was back then and there were so many that were originated right after slavery and and because you know of course they didn't have any insurance uh, you couldn't get insurance from the white companies so that's why a lot of them um were established that was right yeah. mm -hmm. and then after a while when you know after integration they didn't need them anymore so they morphed from these benevolent societies to the social aid and, right. and these are some of the um like the regalia that this person has on it in gas room very similar to those that are worn with the social aid and pleasure clubs. It's sort of the same uh, technique of um, making the regalia that they use in the in the processions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they have the streamers going across their shoulders to the waist, and and Mr. Uh, Youngblood is holding a basket. You know, the basket has a a baby doll in the bottom of it that's decorated with her umbrella. So yeah, they're really elaborate in the way that they make the, the yeah, suits. Yeah, but you know, these are definitely African-based uh, traditions. Uh, the whole concept of it, you celebrate your death, the death of someone, because you, you really celebrate his life. Right, yeah. right. You mourn, you mourn when they're born and you celebrate when you die. So that's what the tradition is like in, uh, in New Orleans. Um, it's very African-based uh, um, celebrations that are done. I must say, when you all are out there with these celebrations, with the jazz funerals, the social aid and pleasure clubs, the, the Mardi Gras Indians, uh, don't you feel conflicted sometimes because you grew up with these traditions and I'm sure you still, you know, are, are wanting to celebrate with them. So, so did I. So as a researcher, cultural researcher, when I'm out there, you know, sometimes I want to just drop the, the pencil and pad or the, of the camera and just join in the celebration. So I'm pretty sure you all are on both sides of the of the lens of your cameras. And I'm yeah. pretty sure that's how, how do you deal with that? 
you, you stop or you put the camera down to go and enjoy yourself and then you miss the shot of the day. So, so what do you do? With, with me, I, um, I, I know what you mean because it's hard not to. And I participate sometimes. Sometimes I just have my camera at my side and I'm dancing along with everybody else. You know, because yeah, sometimes it's hard not to, you the know. music, if it's, I mean, it's intense and sometimes it hits you and you got to move too. <laughs> yeah, it's music, it, you know, just, I mean, we do our best, but to feel it, to breathe it, you know, it's just, you know, I'm, I mean, you could be having a bad day and don't even know who the person is and wind up in the procession and a couple hours of your time gone. And before you know it, you might stop somebody and give you some food. I remember, every, like you and Trevor May, we don't even know folk. You could walk in by and people would just offer you food. You know, you could never be hungry in Trevor Oh, they'll invite you in. And but, but, yeah. but for me, um, I'm a participant and I'm an observer. Yeah. So, um, I I mean it's hard not to participate. It, that's us too. So yeah. I um, I enjoy it. I enjoy I enjoy going to document it as well as you know just being a whole part of it. Yeah, because you know it's very important both you know, definitely to document it. Yeah. yeah, but I think it's also important to be present. Yeah. You know? Even if you are just a participant. Yeah. And I know it was there because when you go to Treme now, there's no life there no more because gentrification have changed our community. Like even now where the Indian used to go practice, they didn't turn into other balls. So it's a whole different energy that's going on through Treme. You know, like I said, I remember Treme, these old houses, they wouldn't be painted all up like now but you would see old ladies peeping out the screen door and you could smell gumbo or red beans. Just different aromas of flavor. <laughs> children playing, you know, you go, now. Nah, I gotta, man, you, you catch anybody outside. So it's a different flavor now in New Orleans. So I'm glad that me and Chandra, you know, cause you never see things changing till you go back, you know, like when you go through a neighborhood, mm -hmm. um, because me and Shonda, we street photographers. We love to see kids out playing on the street. Uh, and those moments are gone now, you know? And you know what? And I, I know this is probably not a part of the conversation, but I know that change and all those things have to come, but the way that change comes is not always correct. Mm -hmm. And just looking at these neighborhoods in my city, it's terrible. It's ridiculous because people who have now occupied the spaces aren't even here or something. I mean, I don't know. What like we is. document New Orleans East right now. And it's so sad because when we, before, like when we did Desire, the St. Thomas Project, all those houses, we know someone's coming. I see Chandra. Something is coming. So we started photographing. And then recently we was in the Iberville. Now you got two lane lost two students living all through those coat ways. And you know, it's a whole thing. And I was like, wow. And then when we go out now to see where the people have been displaced, because they can't come back to the city once you put out. It's not easy to get back, you know. Mm -hmm. So it is. You know, it's, it's, it's almost a nightmare to see what didn't yeah, happen. It is a nightmare. Yeah. You know? you, one of your exhibits dealt with um, the return home, right? It was how difficult it was to return home after Katrina. Yeah, the right to return. Yeah, they were right. return. Mm -hmm. they got our community green space and, you know, writing all these things in all of different papers that we were reading, you know, about, you know, claiming the land. And what well, the problem right now. So the show was actually like, a right to return. We have a right to return to where we came from and, and the work, um, what happened to it as well was a part of that. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, now, let, the next slide, please. Tell us about this lady. What's going on here? It's the original baby doll. Yeah. You have to explain to the audience what, what the baby, baby doll stood for during Mardi Gras. Uh -huh. 
Explain. Explain to the audience what the baby doll stood for during Mardi Gras. Oh, John, explain it for me. Would... Okay. <laughs> what I know. Yeah, wait, I'm the baby to dolls the were a group of women um, that that danced. They all dressed alike. They wore um, these dresses. They were kind of short with the bonnets and they had pacifiers for necklaces and they wore garters. But my understanding too is that they would have a male and they would, he, he would be, I don't know, something like a conductor or whatever. And they go to different spots and they would dance and, and they, they do steps. And I'm not sure. Joyce, maybe you can help me. Were they ladies of the evening? I think, yes. I think they were. We didn't know they were ladies of the evening I'm, from no, school. No, I'm girl. stop. Okay. Anyway, yeah. so this this lady was one of the original baby dolls that he photographed in the eighties, and one of them faces in Tremaine. Yeah. Yeah, she's she What's she's a, she was um from the Tremaine community. Yeah. I, we don't remember her name. I'm sure he has it on file. But. Yeah, the the late the uh, baby dolls were normally uh, many times prostitutes, and this is during carnival, right? Mardi Gras period, and so they would dress, you know, as another persona, totally opposite, you know, an innocent baby, yeah. as opposed to um, being what they, you know, their profession as a, as a, as a prostitute and. And they would dress and uh, would, they would go around like a crew, but they were they were walking. This was walking Mardi Gras in the in the neighborhoods, in the black neighborhoods. We had people like the the baby dolls. We had the skeleton man. You had the, the, yeah. the um, Mardi Gras Indians and the the moss men. And so these were the people who actually dressed and walked. They didn't ride the floats like most people see in during Mardi Gras. You have to go and walk through the black neighborhoods to see these um, crews of people that, you know, that decided that they were gonna dress up and be the other just for the day. And uh, they could, um, you know, and, and that was one thing. I mean, just looking at the Mardi Gras Indians, you know, they, they can be the laborers, um, but that one day of the year, they were queens or they kings or they chiefs, you know, and so they planned all year for that one day. And they may be in, in, the, in the community, you know them as chief so-and-so or queen so-and-so, uh, that's baby doll, whatever, you know, their other name during Mardi Gras. But, you know, that, that is how they were known and that's how, that was their identity. Not just that one day of the year, but all during the year in their community. So, and this was just kind of like one of the really extreme cases where the prostitutes came out as baby dolls. Yeah. <laughs> Next slide. Okay. The Social Aid and Pleasure Club. Yes. Um, this is the six ward steppers and uh, well, high rollers, I'm sorry. Six ward high rollers. And this is uh, a young man named Tom. I can't remember. But Tom was the grand marshal. They, they, um, they pulled the parade. It was, it was three men. It was James, Tom, and Nat. Nat, Nat used to also be a part of the Young Men Olympia. And that was a really, it was a big parade. It was only like, I see three men in one band, but that was a big parade. And it was, it was really- That was the rebirth really for his big gig because Dirty yeah. Dozen was supposed to play. Right. Okay. Next slide. I'm gonna move into uh, looking at some of your slavery, um, the, the uh, prison industrial, um, uh, slavery um, oh, complex. Yeah. And um, how, why Angola? Why did, why did you all go there? Why did you decide to work with well, Angola? Angola to me growing up was a home away from home. Most of the guys we grew up with, they spend their time in and out New Orleans. I mean, we grew up hearing songs about Angola. I heard men who would sit at the card table and talk to my daddy because they were long showmen and stuff and talk about the pain in Angola. So growing up in New Orleans, you know, you hear a lot about the prisons. So in the early 80s, I met a French photographer, Bernard Herman, and he 
was documenting New Orleans. He was doing a color book on New Orleans and me and him became friends. And by him being a French journalist, we started talking one day and he was asking because he loved, talked about a lot. He knew a lot of history. You know, sometimes people come away know more about our history than us. So when he went to talking, I said, well, maybe we can get, you can get the clearance and we got to go to Angola. So when I went to Angola, you know, we live on both sides of the land. There's so many people that I grew up was there that we knew. And as our collaboration started going on, we started meeting guys in the prison who were active in the prison, changing things in the prison. Angola didn't change because they changed the guys who were working and like Lawrence Henderson, those guys were in the law library suing the prison. So through our years, we built collaboration with those guys and continue to, to this day. But a lot of times, uh, me and Chandra, we had, we was able to get to part of the prison where, where normally they don't just send photographers, you know, by knowing the guys, like, you know, working with the guy, Wilbur Riedel, all those guys on the angle, like, you know, so we was watching it. And with Aaron Neville, he would go and make performance, we would go with him. It was like, you know, over the years we accumulated, a, a, you know, a, a lot of imagery from just going, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and, and one thing I know that you all like to, to form that relationship and rapport with the people that you're working with, um, just like I like to do as a cultural worker. And most of your shots were long range, but I see that you do have some that are pretty close up. So you were able to really talk to some and get to know their stories. Um, and well, I didn't feel, we didn't feel like, like when I went back here, like there's a guy here, this is Glenn Demorell, who we grew up in the same neighborhood. And we know Chandra grew up with his sisters and his mama. What I'm saying, I'm not like no photographer, like, I grew yeah. up with his sisters and, and knew him. Yeah, and when I go to Angola, Shonda knew all the guys. They'd be like, hey, because she was queen of the school. So it's sort of like, you know, you know. Let we, me go ahead. It's a different when you kind of know people. And even though a guy might be in Angola for murder, but his mother could be the mother of the church up the street. That, that you know, when we go, she said, well, check on my boy or something. When you live in the community among the people, you can feel the pain. You know, I know mothers who daily and fathers get on buses of going to Angola for years to see about their children. And just because some boy might went to prison, his family, you know, because his whole family is suffering through that ordeal. So we get to talk to people in the community about uh, checking on their family members, or, you know. That's what I want to say is that um, the communities that we live in, I mean, we're, we're seeing things today because of um, social media and video of how African-Americans are treated. Mm -hmm. So I'm saying that in our community, like Keith was talking, when we came up, we knew people that would go to jail or whatever. And sometimes you hear, oh, that they didn't do that or whatever, mm -hmm. but I'm just saying, that we come from a community where there are many families who have someone in their family incarcerated. Somebody so we knew somebody. people, we knew people from our community who had family members. And I have classmates who have gone to prison. So when we went there, we tried to somehow seek, or if we ran across those people, try to get, yeah. um, you know, establish some type of report. Now, now this picture yeah. here is 23 hour lockdown. And that's where a guy get one hour out of his cell, you know. A day. And to, uh, yeah, and the other guys were playing chess. And um, it just was an interesting moment, you know. So what do you think is your role as far as looking at uh, the issues of social justice with your exhibits? Um, you know, when you when you bring these images outside, so what, you know, what do you feel that your role is? To try, well, especially with the prison is to try to bring to our young kids before it be too late, because a lot of them don't see imagery till you get there. And 
I mean, it's nice that we didn't been to the Venice Biennial with this show, but to me, when I get kids from my own neighborhood to bring them and show them this work, to try to show that uh, two and a half hour ride, you can go back to back in time a hundred years when you go to Angola. And unfortunately, kids in the inner city is the prey because these towns these prisons depend on us to be there. You know, they need body count, especially if you're a private home prison. You don't, you don't want no empty prison, right? So mm -hmm. the, work, the work we're trying to reflect to me and any artist, a lot of, like there's a great show going on, uh, Marking Times that Nicole Fleetwood just put together. Um, and I just bring attention to letting kids see because there's nobody giving our kids no warning of what's happening out here that, that you know, you go out here and take somebody caught and you're gonna wind up doing 10, 20 years. So, you know, but if they see these conditions that you're gonna walk in the field, you know, Angola is, you know. So I, I, what I wanted to say is- Next slide while they're talking. So we can see some yeah. of it. Venice Biennial was a great venue because it made it international and the issue um, was shared with more people. Yeah. And I think that, you know, as we exhibit the work and talk about it, it it's a platform Not for this us. picture, I'm sorry. It's just a platform for us, for people who may be able to work in policy changing or whatever way can contribute to um, injustices that are happening, you know, in a positive way. Like right. this picture here, that's, we call that, um, what do you call him? Who's that man? Who's that man on the horse? <laughs> and that man that right now in the morning gonna be on that horse. And that, that looked like could be 1900 to me when I was seeing that, right? I mean, that's the gun line. Meaning if you don't, you, you, you step off that line, you know, you're gonna, you're gonna see those gates. But I'm just saying that for a young kid growing up in inner city right now, when he hit that field, that's another world in this time, you see? So that's why we call it slavery, because you know, you're know gonna get it in. Are you all working with the project, um, with the prison project now? With a young man, you know, if you talk about that for a moment. Yeah, we work in, um, we work with different guys coming home. Like we got guys we working with in, you know, on different projects. We working now with Gary Tyler, who we trying to help get his studio together. Cause Gary created not only the theater, worked in the theater, but he was a great artist um, in the prison quilt maker. And since he's been released, we try- He's a print maker also. Yeah. I mean, there's so many guys that's in prison that you don't get to see or hear about the town. We always hear about the negative, but there's a lot of guys in Inks, you know, we just know Kevin, you know, people like Kevin Duncans and guys been working in inside the prison that, you know, you don't see much write-ups about these guys, but there's a lot of guys up there that are doing work and we try to get involved in any way we can help with that because and Calvin is a huge success story as well because Calvin served, I think, 27 years in Angola. Um, and he he he's he now has a law degree from Tulane University. He graduated last year. Yeah. Um when he said he when he got out, he just went to Tulane to I don't know if he was going to get some papers or do something. And he looked around, he said. I think I'm gonna enroll. And he did, and he, he graduated last year. So he was one of those persons working with Norris Henderson in the law library in Angola. Yeah. And he's he's now um, a legal attorney. But you know, I think the main concern now is to look at uh, look at the situation for women being incarcerated because now it's a large amount of women being incarcerated and it's not a lot of support, you know, mm -hmm. and, you know, so, but I think we need more artists like me and Shauna was saying, we need more artists to get engaged in documenting the community now and, and keeping it going because 
I know in right. some of them now they have a uh, well, like in well in Quentin they have a, a art program for for the prisoners to work. Yeah. And I, I don't know if they they have that at, at uh, Angola too because I I've gone to the art show a couple of times and I don't yes, know. they very well. Great art. Yeah. Angola mm -hmm. does have um, educational programs and they have art programs. I've been to other um, institutions that actually don't have a lot of those types of things. Not saying that, you know, what they do is any better, but I'm just saying there's some people that don't even have those privileges of having the art and the education and inspiration. Right. Exactly. Next slide. <clears throat> Tell us about this elderly man. I think he's a beautiful man. <laughs> he's, um, his, they called him daddy -o. And um, Daddy, when I met him, he was 75. And he, at that time, was the yeah, oldest yeah, prisoner yeah. in Angola. Yeah, he was older. And um, he, uh, he, he came from the town of San Francisville, um, where Angola is. And he said that he had served 15 years or something. And he was released. And then he went home, you know, like to St. Francisville, the same little town. And he was home for less than a month, maybe three weeks, and something happened in the town. And he said they just came back and got him. And he served the rest of his life in Angola. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, sometimes people don't have money to fight. They don't have a lot of, like, and we don't. So I don't know, in his situation, I think it was, Finance and education, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Next slide. We're gonna have to move a little, little bit faster. And what, what was, what is this one? That's called the hoop nanny. The hoop nanny gonna ride no matter what. If they have a stabbing, they just gonna throw you off and keep that. The work gonna go on, you know. And it just kind of remind me when I seen it. It remind me of like, I mean. It's, it's a transport wagon. Yeah, for those who don't know. but they call it the hoop nanny, and uh, mm -hmm. and finding out what happens on the hoop nanny is it's a lot of lot goes on on that hoop nanny. Okay, they're bringing them to somewhere in the field to work, and this mm -hmm. is called work call. This is where all the men have to meet up in the morning, um, and it's really important to be here. Because if you miss your number, if you get there after they called your number, that's it. You have you're gonna have some lockdown. consequences. You go to lockdown and all of that. So, and the other thing about getting here is that in the prison they have large dormitories full of men, men, like 200 men, but they only have like five bathrooms. And so, imagine having to be here. You know, somebody's going undone. Yeah, you're gonna get a write up. Yeah, somebody gonna. It's just too many men with not enough facilities. Yeah. Okay, next we're gonna have to move on and look at some of the southbound images. And um, of course, these are basically um, dealing with Katrina. Some of the images that you all pulled, you might say, pulled out of <laughs> Katrina. Katrina was traumatic and very transformative. And some people were transformed on that day, that very day that the hurricane happened. Some maybe two months later, some five years later, but if you were a part of Katrina, you were transformed in some way. What could you say, um, how, uh, how can you say you all were transformed and what happened to your work? How was your work transformed after going through um, this traumatic experience? Well, I think in the beginning, just going through it, um, it was like surreal. It wasn't, you know, I, I visually saw it and I visually knew it, but it, it was unreal. And then because it was all of the work, it just looked like it was everything. So it was unreal. And then after, I think, 
coming to grips with that, you know, because you look around, though we lost the work or we thought we lost because what we've salvaged, we've managed to make this work out of it. Um, I know people in my community that suffered a lot more than us. You know, they lost family members, you know, so much tragedy with life. I, I, you know, Keith and I just said, you know, okay, it's something that we could get back, you know, maybe not what we had, but we can work and get more work, but people can't work and replace lives. So we started looking at it like that. Um, and um, I think trying not to take many things for granted. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and what, what do you call this process that we're seeing on this image, the two images of, that are here now? This is before Katrina and, and after, or? Yeah, well, um, this is one of the photos of a man, we call him Foots Etar. He was a dock worker. And uh, when we shoot uh, just the original, and then when the water hit, when we, we left all our work here, and then it was in these bins, and when the water came in, uh, we, that's a black and white and that's a slide. That's we came back and we put everything in the freezer. So after, I think three or four years, we started taking them out the freezer and, and you know, we have to scan them quickly, but this water just took them to another level, you know, mm -hmm. and some of our work is in perfect condition. And then we'll find some damage like that. So instead of throwing work away, uh, we kept it and put it, and, and even to now, I got a freezer full of stuff. Um, and you, we don't have to do any Photoshop or anything, just scan and we print. You know, me and Shonda, we traditionalists, I don't believe in Photoshop and all that stuff, you know? We, next slide. And talk a bit about this one. Okay, this is also in Phoenix with Reverend Summers. It's one of those little girls you saw in the prayer. So this is mm -hmm. one of those little girls and I just walked in the river with them to take the pictures to show the people on the banks that witnessed the baptism. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> I just, and, and so this is an image oh, that was damaged mm -hmm. um, and it looked like this when I came back from Katrina and when we saw all of our work submerged in the nasty water, any image that I could get, I kept. And so I scanned this image and this is, this is what I had until we went through the work and I found the original, actually found the original and it needed to be rewashed um, so I, I have shown both of them like side by side. So it's like the effects of the damage of the, the print it is, it, well, it was somehow transformed. Uh, it, you know, the damage has transformed the image into another artistic piece. <laughs> yeah, yes. Another patina. Yeah. Yeah. Give it. With the slides, it seems like the motion shifted all over. There's mold and um yeah the the colors were muted yeah it, it's, it's almost like it, it really they, they sort have, of documented the, the still the vibrancy you know of this this tradition here this this baptism here you know you still see the vibrancy of it all you know so you got them before the flood and after the flood but it's still vibrant thank you somewhat transformed but yeah. still vibrant Still spiritual. Next and at time. one time we would throw a print like we would throw away a lot of prints like that. Uh, uh, he would do that. I I never like this to is throw the great away prints or or like the, if the negative didn't wasn't good. You know, at one time when I first met Keith, was like, oh, that's not good. Throw. I'm like, you can't throw that away. And I didn't even know any better, but. <laughs> 
But oh, yeah, I'm glad <laughs> that I didn't throw it away. This is Tootie Montana. To me, one of the biggest chiefs in the city. He was the big chief of the Yellow Pocahontas. And another, this was a slide, you know, that that the water hit. And um, I couldn't have never even dream about making the colors that, that happened to, to the way the, the way the water like hit some of the emotion in there, you know. At one time, you know, in, in my old day, we would call this just a piece got damaged, but when you when you print them, because even when we seen them in a rough damage, we couldn't see it till we made a print. Yeah, you can't tell what's on the slide because it just looks like specks and yeah. stuff. It is nothing but when look like this. I mean, they're beautiful. The other thing about the slides, you can see how colorful our city, called city's culture is. You know, like all of those colors bursting out. That, you know, that's what the people had on. I mean, it's also the cyan and the magenta and all that in the film, but it's also the, the colors. That's why it's mm -hmm. film yeah. to me. Yeah, it's just kind of morphed into something else, almost much bigger than what it was initially. Yeah. And this is a church scene? Yeah, now that's Mount Mariah Church where Mahalia Jackson uh, came out of. And uh, this is the rebirth. And that's again, you, you see the community behind the, the, the band from the community to come do their Sunday. Uh, yeah, like they had a parade this was, every year. This this was an annual parade. Yeah, and Mount Mariah. And they had the Rebirth Brass Band. The Buffalo Soldiers were there. That's where they came and, from. Yeah, in in this church, and they marched through the community. Um, there it was an annual parade, and I think this was Reverend Harvey's church. Yeah, Reverend Harvey. Yeah, home. but again, look at a look how the emotion cracked, you know, and some of the images are there, and then. I just couldn't, you know, even thought about doing nothing like this. It's amazing every time we go in our freezer and pull more work out, you know, to see how the water effect, you know, like this one here too is interesting. It's the trunk. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think that's that's one of one of the guys in Doc Paulin's band. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And this is the lady walking underneath the interstate, but I like the line that he was walking. Mm -hmm. And then oh, like over you see the line overhead, that's the interstate, but that's like the the crack. So the light is coming through that down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all right. Next slide. This is one of my favorite shots of Dr. Michael White and a tuxedo brass band mm -hmm. and little Kermit on the side over there in the back. On the right. Mm -hmm. This was the uptown funeral. Jazz funeral. Again, mm -hmm. Yeah. At one time, and we would call this reticulation. And then I mean, when you was processing your film, the emotion would get real hot and it would give that cracky effect. And it was like, oh, you don't ever want it. But when we pull that and seen it, I just printed it. Well, you if you printed something like that, you'd lose your job. Yeah. You know, I mean, if it, but I'm sure reticulation looks sort of like this. There'd be bubbles and all of that as well. And if I saw something like this back then, I might have thought, oh my, that's really autistic. I mean, it's a little different than the reticulation, but. Mm -hmm. All I've got, I gotta live with it. <laughs> Next one. And this is ever uh the plantation. I shot this at the plantation, um where they got the um, tourist place and uh Whitney. Whitney where Whitney plantation. plantation is now. Yeah. This but oh, that was a the yeah, Levere plantation. Ever, evergreen, might have was evergreen. That is evergreen. Yeah. That's evergreen. Mm -hmm. Next. Okay, and this is our last one. It's called America. And I guess it's uh, really befitting to end with this since we just um, 
had an inauguration last week and yeah. <laughs> so like all these colors are coming together. So it's very symbolic of what we are attempting to do again <laughs> in, um, in the US. So you, would you talk about this one? Yeah. Can I, yeah, I'll, I'll just say, um, I, I had named it that title after the hurricane, but that's not, this is Keith's image. It's upside down actually. And it is, it, 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 it was an image of the bicentennial actually at Bell, School. at Bell Junior High School. Mm -hmm. That was the bicentennial celebration and that was with students um, with the flags. But I felt some kind of way after. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, you know, I just thought that would have been, that, that probably, I didn't know that it had ever been published with that title on it, but it's okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We got to open up to, and we might have a few questions. So we see if we can get a few questions. Uh, any questions right. in the in the chat or? Joyce, are you able to see those, or do you want me to read a few? I can't see them. So you okay? Great. I'll do. I'll do it. So um, Jessica asked pretty early on in in the in the talk. I think when you were on the River Road section about when people were put out of work by the machines, what kind of work did they end up doing next? Well, there wasn't no work left for them. A lot of them wind up being pushed off to come to live in the city. Because at that time, um, like I say, the machine, the back, I don't know, things were changing in a lot of the rural parishes where machinery were coming in and it was bringing in more migrant workers. Because even now, like when we go to some places, that's what got me with some of these planters. You would go see American brick and they didn't want the people, but you go on some of them crawfish, they got all migrant workers living there now, you know? So it was kind of scary in the landscape of seeing, right now, you know, I feel for the men in prison, but they got women like in Northeast Louisiana where they ain't no work no more. Because like I say, the, the whole thing is no need for black labor. That's what our work been about, the demise of labor because Again, here in New Orleans, we had the docks. And when you came to work, you could come out of Angola. My dad had men in his gang came straight from Angola and went and worked on the riverfront and built a house and a family. You don't have that no more. You know, certain things, the way we could survive in the community has been eliminated. I remember going to the French market. You used to go there um, and get all type of fruits of China grandfather. People would bring stuff to the market. And now it's just none of that going around anymore, you know, for us, the labor force. Like I said, when we go to Louisiana now, we go to cell prisons, East Carroll pr Parish prisons. So the women are doing the dog worse than the men to me in, in some of these parishes. There's nothing there for them. And it ain't just black, it's got poor white too. Some of them don't know that they're just as bad off as us, but you can go through some of these back roads and it's, it's, it's gutted out right now. And um, so our job is to try to, you know, we don't make any money to me. Like I tell a lot of artists, when you go out and you do work, that's your pay. You know, if you could go do something you enjoy doing, you know, you know I know a lot of great artists in New Orleans, great, but we never made any funding, but we, we go out and make work. But um, Rick LeCompte asked, uh, what cameras were you using? Um, <laughs> Um, I used to shoot with a Nikon mat and um, oh, when I first started top and um, we moved to, well, I, to Nikon system and two I shoot a Hasselblad too, five. but um, yeah. In the old days, well, we still shoot film, not as much as we used to, but. A lot of those sugarcane pictures were made with a Nikon mat. Yeah, yeah, Nine. Chandra shot Nikon mat. I used to shoot with a two and a quarter. Uh, has a blade camera, and then I shot uh, Nikon Mat. Yeah. I think we may have time for just one or two more questions if anyone wants to use to raise their hand and ask themselves or click one more question in the chat. I think I caught all the ones I've seen in the in the chat. And thank you to Helen Regis for um, she sent links for a lot of the things you brought up. Um, yeah. Well, she's hey. a colleague of yours, Joyce. Yeah, yeah. yeah she's in the anthropology department. 
We remember her first, second line. Right. <laughs> well, I'm not seeing anyone, and I am just so grateful to all of you for um, attending and Joyce for facilitating this conversation, and Keith and Chandra. It was great to meet you on Zoom, and I really appreciate how much you shared and how in-depth you went um, kind of about your whole oeuvre um, over the years. So um, with that, I think, is there anything else you want to add, Joyce? I just wanted to see. You, oh, I'm sorry. No, I, I think we've actually kind of gone over time, but. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay. Chandra, did you have last, last comments? I just wanted to say thanks to you all at LSU uh, Museum of Art. Thanks okay. to the Housing Institute and Mark Long and Mark Long and Mark yeah. Sloan, and you, Courtney and Dr. Joyce uh, Jackson. Thank you all for having us and the audience. Thanks for your participation. My all pleasure. Right. Thank you for coming. Mm -hmm. Thanks everyone for joining. And we have one more on Thursday night. If you've registered, you will get the link the day of the talk. Um, and with that, I would just say good night and we hope to see you again soon. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.